All right. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Aveline de Sheresbrook. I hail from the Barony of Flaming Griffin in the Kingdom of the Midrealm. Thank you very much for attending tonight. This evening's class is going to be about engaging displays and demonstrations. So I have a PowerPoint that I have created for you. Um, the time slot that we have been slated to was originally supposed to be one hour, but they gave us two hours. So I will tell you that the bulk of the presentation will actually be in that first hour or so, though we may go into that second hour and I may open it up to if people want to bounce ideas off of each other of ways that they might be able to improve or even set up their display or demonstration. We may have some time to have that conversation as well. I will tell you from the get-go that all of the people whose displays I have included in this presentation have consented to have their um, artwork as well as their display and photograph of their display if they're the ones that took the photograph included in this presentation. I'm only including um, displays that I think have one or more many fantastic elements and so we won't really be critiquing too much any of theirs. However, I do have a couple of my own displays that we can rip apart and make fun of and say, wow, you really needed to improve on this or hey, we can see where you're going with this. So be gentle with um, anybody else's displays but mine you can have at me. So um, what I did was created a presentation to really try to get people to think about how they're going to display um, anything that is related to their hobby. Now, for the most part, anybody that's attending is probably a reenactor or living historian of some sort. However, I also know that I have a couple of people that participate in some of the boffer sports or other live action role playing games that also present their things in displays or exhibitions or demonstrations. And so a lot of this content will also very much cross apply to those fields as well. Um, but for the most part, if I'm talking about the SCA or living historians or reenactors, we're kind of talking about anybody that basically wants to put their stuff out there for others to see and hopefully to get them excited about it, as excited as they are themselves. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with the sharing of the screen. And Audette, I saw her peek her head in at one point. This is one of her displays and we will go over this much more in depth, but this was just one of the most visually appealing displays that I have seen very recently. And I just kind of wanted to titillate you a little bit with that one. So let's talk about displays and demonstrations. I can click, there we go. So just for some working definitions in terms of what we're going to be talking about tonight, just to kind of make sure we're all on the same uh, page. A display is basically something you're going to put out and exhibit for others to look at. Uh, it's usually a collection of objects. Sometimes it's a collection of pictures. It is usually a very conspicuous thing. It is out in a public, uh, heavily trafficked, hopefully, area for people to come by and see. Um, and sometimes a display also includes not just objects or items or pictures, but it also includes a performance or a show or some type of event that is intended for public entertainment. A demonstration is very much the same as a display, but usually with one additional element, and that is there is some sort of activity that is also being displayed or demonstrated. Um, it is basically a way of showing an action or a process or even one step or maybe all the steps of doing something or how something could be done. Um, these definitions are pretty much dictionary definitions. <laughs> One the dictionary definition was to clearly show. And so hopefully, not only will you clearly show, but you will excite people about this in general. So what makes a display or a demonstration successful, effective, engaging? Well, I did a lot of reading. I have tried and failed myself with some things. I've looked at a lot of pictures of displays. I had a bunch of people that submitted things. And I've also done a lot of reading of um, people that are in the academic community whose job it is, whose research field of interest is how to make effective displays, exhibits, um, demonstrations, museum quality uh, in some cases. So there are very uh, common things, elements that you were seeing in what everybody was defining as something being successful. The first is that it is visually appealing. Now, for most people, that means beautiful, but sometimes not always. It's something that's like, hey, what's that over there? What's, what's going on over here? I need to go over and see this. The next is that the subject matter is interesting and or relatable. The next is that the, ex the exhibit, display, or demonstration tells a memorable story to those that are there 
viewing it. Additionally, it is educational or informative. It provides some sort of entertaining experience, even if it's not a hands-on experience, so to speak. It is something that they're going to remember. They're going to tell somebody about the next day at the water cooler. They're going to, you know, blog about it. They're going to take pictures and put it up on Facebook. It's going to be something that provides some pleasure or entertainment. Additionally, if all goes well, and if this is your goal, this extra thing is that it motivates additional exploration. Again, I mentioned this earlier. If you're excited about this and you're displaying it or demonstrating it or putting it out there for people, the likelihood is you want other people to be as excited about your topic as you are. And so the hope is by displaying these things, it will motivate those to look into a little bit more, maybe give it a try out, maybe do some more research or even you know, try their hand at something just right there at the display or demonstration. So what are the steps? How do you even get started? To make this easy, I'm going to give the steps as you would to just do a display. Now, sometimes the display you're present at, or sometimes you put a display out and you are asked not to be present at. Um, so keep that in mind as we're going through these steps and some of these um, tips and tricks and suggestions that are given to you. And then we'll also talk along the way at each of the steps, when you're doing a demonstration, how can you also, um, how can you also complete this step? The step one for both a display and a demonstration is really exactly the same, and that is identifying your audience. Now, very often, especially in the context of people like us, many of us that are attending, that either are LARPers or we do boffer sports or we do some kind of living history or reenactment, a lot of times your demonstrations or displays are to a general public. That is people who do not participate in the same activity or hobby or um, art or science that you do. And that can include adults, teenagers, and kids and babies. And you need to be thinking about that. It's really easy for a lot of people just to go, eh, toddlers and babies, they're not gonna really get any kind of enjoyment. There's nothing for them in this. So I'm just gonna focus on adults and teens. And sometimes for your particular subject area, that may very well be the, the salient or the, the right way to do it. But sometimes you might think as you're considering who your audience could potentially be, hey, you know, I have this thing that, you know, two or three year old might enjoy uh, playing with this, um, this toy, or I've seen displays on little wooden horses that were in fact for children. Obviously they made sure they were very safe, they were well polished and, you know, all that, but you want to think about who is going to be seeing, viewing, participating, partaking in some way your display or your demonstration. Additionally, you might be basically displaying or demonstrating to other living historians. Perhaps you're at an event and you are displaying something that you have worked on to other people who don't necessarily have a particular stake, vested interest, or commonality in that particular subject, but the subject at whole. They're interested in history, they're interested in reenactment, they're interested in, you know, reconstructing things. They may not be a textiles person, you're, you are a textiles person, but they're gonna, they have a, a little more of a vested stake or interest than probably your general public does. Then you have people, and I put here in the circle just to make it easy, basically judges and colleagues, and that is basically your peers, or if you're in fact trying to have a display that is going to be judged in some fashion or critiqued, these people, very much like the other living historians, are obviously in that same boat. However, they're also going to be looking at whatever it is you're displaying or demonstrating with a much more critical eye. They are in fact judging, evaluating, going to give you criticism, sometimes negative, hopefully more positive, or at least constructive criticism. So you need to think about who it is that you are going to be displaying or demonstrating in front of. Either display or demonstrations, you pretty much have to do this step no matter how you're gonna do it. However, it's not just demographics in terms of how did they come to you. You also need to think about some of the other things that might have a very direct impact in people's experiences, such as those who might have physical disabilities, people that might have cognitive or neurodevelopmental disabilities, people that have sensory challenges or can be easily sensory, sensorily overstimulated, or even people that have other needs. So as you're going to start creating or, or planning your display or demonstration, you need to think about who's coming to see you and what might be impacting their experience that I also need to think about and accommodate or consider. 
The second step is you need to select your approach. Now, in the reading of the research that I have been doing, there was a really fantastic article. It was published in 1994 in a journal called Visitor Behavior, which is actually specifically to address a museum, both art, history, natural science, those types of museums, their visitors, their patrons, when they came to their establishments to look at their exhibits and displays, what were they looking for? What were they moved by? What were they motivated by? What did they respond really well to? And what did they kind of not really care about that maybe the uh, person putting the display together thought that people would be interested in? So I've got this, um, this uh, website here. You can copy it down now or towards the end of this, I will try and cut and paste that so that you can also download this. However, the most crucial part to me, what was the biggest takeaway for me from this article was the seven approaches to design for an exhibit display demonstration that uh, Stephen Bitgood kind of defined. The first one was something he calls the subject matter approach. Excuse me. It's basically that the major emphasis of your display demonstration or exhibit is in completing, is in, uh, is in, wow, excuse me, is in conveying complete and accurate information with less concern about how good it looks or how the message will even be received by the exhibit's audience or even the aesthetic appeal. It's really just information. I just care about the information as much as possible. The next approach is something he defines as the aesthetic approach, and that is, I want it to look good. It needs to be beauty. The major concern in the aesthetic appeal is actually in the presentation itself. In this approach, aesthetics takes precedence over the message or the impact on the audiences other than the artistic community. The next approach that he defines is something he calls the hedonistic approach. The major concern is that the audience is just going to have a good time. Enjoyment or entertainment is the primary emphasis. The fourth approach that he defines is something called the realistic approach. The major focus is to create a simulated realistic experience. For example, an exhibit may attempt to produce a simulated experience of a natural habitat or a ride in a spaceship. So if you think about those natural history museums that you've been to, or when you were actually in the science museum and you're in the middle of a rocket ship, that is in part a realistic approach to an exhibit demonstration or display. The next approach that uh, Stephen Bitgood defines is something he calls the hands-on approach, which is essentially that exhibits are designed with the assumption that hands-on activities are inherently more effective than exhibits which require passive viewing. And a lot of the science really very much supports this. Um, the next approach is socialization or social facilitation approach, which means when you're taking this strategy, you are attempting to produce exhibits that actually allow for and stimulate social interaction among visitor groups. These, this approach actually is perfect if you're doing something that is for a, a team building audience, for example. The last approach that he defines is something that he calls the individual difference approach, which is basically that designers are attempting to develop an exhibit for audiences who differ on one or more of their characteristics or demographics or needs or the way in which they learn and process information. Audiences may learn or have differences in learning preferences, learning style, cognitive ability, age, education level, interest level, reasoning skills, etc. And so this approach really is on, I want to make sure that everybody is going to come here and have a good time. It's essentially the universal design. So this is the recap of those seven approaches that Stephen Bitwood defines. Now, why is this important? So Stephen Bitwood says the three most commonly used approaches were, and this is back in 1994, the subject matter approach, so basically worrying about information, the aesthetic approach, and the hedonistic approach. At that time, the hands-on approach wasn't as actively used or even studied, but I think it's fairly safe to say nowadays that the science very much supports that a hands-on approach tends to lead to the best learning, the best engagement, and the best memory retention. So Bitgood says about the three approaches that he defines as the most effective, or at least the most frequently used, while all three approaches have merits and should be considered, overemphasizing one and neglecting the other approach is likely to create problems in exhibit effectiveness because of failure to communicate important messages, failure to be attractive, or failure to create a satisfying experience for visitors. So you can't just focus on one 
but you also can't do all seven. I mean, you can, there will be small elements of all seven, hopefully, but don't try to get all seven completely 100% filled. So let's go back to the example. If I have just a general demonstration, I'm at say a Renaissance festival or um, some kind of conference or, or convention, and I want to engage people. I know it's gonna be people of all ages, they probably aren't your average uh, his living historian or reenactor because I probably know them if they are and they're probably with me at this demonstration doing it. They're just a general public who is hopefully going to be cued into and their curiosity is going to be piqued by what you're doing. So we have all seven approaches next to it. And like I said, you know, if you are extremely effective, you may be able to apply all seven, but it's actually important for you to prioritize some of these over others because people are expecting prioritization of those things. For example, a general public demonstration, generally speaking, you will want to focus on and prioritize these three things, maybe four things. The first is an aesthetic approach, beauty or something that is visually appealing. If it doesn't look interesting, the general public, they're not gonna stop by, or they're gonna kind of glide right by you, but not really stop and be too engaged. The second is that there's some form of entertainment and the third is that there's some form of engagement. When they go to an event, when they're out and about and they see you, the only reason they're gonna stop is because it looks interesting and it looks like it might be fun, okay? Now, if we're doing something um, where you're trying to sneak in a little bit of information and hopefully educate, which is of course the mission of the Society for Creative Anachronism, then you might try to eke in the subject matter approach, which is you try to spoon feed them a little bit of information, hopefully just to kind of get them interested and excited. But focusing on really more than two or three approaches, especially when you're just beginning to try to create your display or demonstration is going to be very, very difficult. So now here's an example of a demonstration that we did. It was actually a um, home for people that have uh, cognitive and neurodevelopmental disabilities, as well as many of them presented with physical disabilities as well. They contacted the group that I was with at the time and they said, listen, we really want to do something special for them. We want to do something that's really engaging and fun and exciting for them. Um, some of them are highly functional. Some of them, we are not sure at which level they're functioning, but the most important thing to us is that they feel, first of all, like this was created for them with them in mind and things that they can do. And second of all, we want them to have fun. We want them to have fun with you and learn a little bit, but we also want them to have fun with each other. So it was kind of, as I mentioned earlier, almost like a team building type exercise. So our group, really, uh, although we didn't have this formal analysis of the approaches, in looking back at kind of what we focused on, we focused on these three things for this client, per the client's, or at least the context um, wishes. We focused on engagement. We wanted it to be hands-on. So we had things where they could play certain games. They could learn to sew with a big needle, which was fairly easy for them to handle and manipulate. We um, had uh, dancing and music. We had a demonstration of um, some fighting that they could view. They couldn't, nobody ever participates in the fighting in any of our demonstrations, but we had it set up so that they could view this. So it was sort of a performance of fighting. We also had things, as I mentioned, with the hands-on engagement, we had the social facilitation approach. We made sure to include things where they could do things with each other. So the games was one of the things, the dancing was one of the things. And then we also had it where they could um, draw and do some calligraphy either for themselves or for each other as like gifts and thank you cards. The third thing is obviously we tried to make this as an individual difference approach. We tried to consider as best as we could and with the short amount of time that we had to prepare as well as our own knowledge and what we were being told by the contact, we tried to make it so that it would be as accessible and inclusive as possible to everybody that might be attending, both people that were um, residents of this particular home, as well as their family members who also came and attended this particular demonstration. Now let's talk about general displays. I'm going to an event. I want to put out some work that I did. I want people to take a look at it. I know some people are not really going to care too much. Other people are going to be like, oh yeah, this is my jam. I want to be part of it. So to the average living historian, what do you think, or what, what one might think is going to be the most appealing to them? 
This is my best guess. You may disagree with me on this, and that's okay. If you think one approach is actually going to be more effective, especially if you know the specific living historians that are going to be at your event, then obviously go with what you know. But in terms of what I know and who I generally deal with, I think that these three approaches to the generic SCA Regia Angelorum group are going to be the most important. The first is the subject matter approach. They do want information. They want to be educated. They want to learn. They want to feel like they're taking away something they didn't know before. The second is that they like the realistic approach or some level of immersion. So we tend to be a little more, um, we, we try to be a little less anachronistic with the way we're presenting our things. So maybe we won't just put out a glass mason jar. Perhaps we'll put out some um, pottery that somebody made for us and then we put a little bit of a, a lid over the top of it with some fabric, right? We try to sort of dress up and spruce up our displays for that crowd because we know they value that more. The other thing, and I really debated, so what is that, if I had to pick the third one for just your general living historians, what would you pick? Either social, social facilitation. You basically want, people are there to have a good time with each other. They want to interact. They want to feel like somebody's inviting them to be engaged, whether it's learning, whether it's an actual hands-on exhibit, whether it's a make it and take it kind of display or demonstration. They want to feel like they're included. That's why they're part of this membership organization. The other approach that I was really debating on was basically the uh, hedonistic approach. They want to have a good time. They want entertainment. They want pleasure. They don't want to necessarily think about it too much. They just want to see a, a good show or see a really pretty thing, or they want to be entertained by a very amusing and effective performer. So depending on your group, you might switch that up. Um, but th for the people that I know, and I generally tend to present and display and do demonstrations for within the living historian context or reenactor context, these are the three approaches that I would pick. Your mileage may vary. Now, let's talk a little bit, and this goes to your question, Antonio. <clears throat> I'm not gonna talk about this too much because this is an entire whole other class that it could be, all right? But I am the judges coordinator of the Middle Kingdom, and I see a lot of ANS displays that are intended for critique and judgment. And so let's think about what do those judges or colleagues or peers that we know, whether there's an actual score sheet or we know they're silently sort of judging and critiquing and evaluating what you did, what is the approach that they are going to value or what, are they, what is gonna be the most effective approaches with them? In my opinion, it's very similar to the other one, but I would actually include beauty. So obviously they care about the subject matter. They wanna make sure you did your research. They want the information. They want to know the background of it. They want to understand the historical context and its relevance to whichever hobby that you're doing. They also like the, the immersion approach, right? They want to see things that look very much like it would look in, in whatever period that you're celebrating. But while entertainment is interesting and the hedonistic approach is interesting, if you're thinking about when people are evaluating and critiquing, particularly arts and sciences displays, beauty is also important. They want to see the biggest, the best, the most beautiful, the most intricate, the most complex. And so that is basically, if I were designing something that I knew was going to be in sort of an, an arts and sciences display or something that was most definitely going to be critiqued or judged, whether formally or informally by others, this, these are the approaches that I would focus on. So let's talk a little bit about our biases, right? I've talked about different groups of people or different demographics and how I might consider approaching them. But if I'm being honest, I need to think about, and everybody needs to do this, I need to think about what are the approaches that appeal the most to me? What is going to draw me in? And I was not surprised. This was pretty easy for me to define. For me personally, I want the information. I want full immersion. I want it as period as possible. And I want engagement. I want to get in there. I want to roll up my sleeves. I want to get in the nitty gritty. I don't care if it's dirty. I don't care if it's smelly. I don't care if it's, you know, not pleasant. I want to be a part of it. That's what, uh, that's what appeals to me. Now, do you make your display for somebody like me? Maybe. Maybe that's the type of person you want to attract or um, excite with your display. Or maybe you use some other combination of approaches. But it is important for you to define what approaches would appeal the best to you. Because when you go to create your own display, don't just make a display 
that speaks to your priorities or your um, most favored approaches. That's a really easy thing to want to do, but isn't necessarily the right thing to do. Hopefully that makes sense. We have step two, create or define what approach you want to do. And that is necessarily gonna be based on who you have identified as the audience that you expect to come and view or participate in some way in your display or demonstration. Step three, you need to gather your visuals. The very nature of the words display and demonstrate is that you are trying to show physical proof or evidence. You're trying to demonstrate or display the process, the end result, the tools. So visual things are really going to be the crux of what your display is all about. That could be anything from physical items. It could be pictures or drawings or paintings and any relevant decorations. At this stage, don't worry too much about how you're gonna set up your display. Just think about, okay, what is relevant to what it is I need to show? Then you need to consider featuring visuals of the following types. And these are not um, mutually exclusive. You could have all three, or you could just feature one. The first is you want something that is aesthetically beautiful and pleasing to the eye, even awe-inspiring. You want that one wow factor so that somebody who's starting to trickle by you and not really paying attention or somebody across the room or across the field or whatever goes, what is that? I, I need to see that over there. People like pretty things. That's an undeniable fact. You cannot go wrong in terms of drawing people to you by putting something really beautiful out there. However, while people like pretty things, which is undeniable, if you consider the craze of how people like pictures of abandoned buildings, there is also an attraction to things that are either intentionally or calculatedly ugly. I, hate, I hesitate to use that word, but why, what some might describe as ugly, but you just think is beautiful, something that is destroyed or deconstructed. There's some real value in showing some of your projects that have, um, have n are being shown in a way that you might not expect them to be shown. Um, Elizabeth says, like carved skulls and skeletons, the macabre, exactly. Um, be prepared that whatever you're going to show, whether it's intentionally, you know, destroyed, deconstructed, kind of gruesome or macabre, or whether you think, oh my God, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen, that not everything is for everyone and not everybody's going to give you the response that you necessarily expect, and that's okay. Just move on because there's definitely going to be people that are going to be um, interested and entertained and curious about what it is you're displaying. Um, you want to include tangibles of both the process and the final end product or concept. Because sometimes what you're displaying about isn't necessarily a physical thing. Sometimes it's about research into heraldry um, and heraldic names or something along those lines. Very difficult to, to display. But you need to think about, okay, what is the process of doing those things? Sometimes this is the steps in your arts and science projects. Sometimes it is the research that you're doing. Sometimes it is gathering together photographic evidence to, to do an analysis. Whatever is involved in the thing that you want to display or demonstrate, the, 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 the more you can highlight the really interesting steps of that process, the more effective it is going to be. However, don't throw the, the kitchen sink and everything else at them either. You don't want to overwhelm them with every single step of the process. The minutia is going to get in the way of your average display or demonstration. Unless we're talking about an arts and sciences display that you are being formally judged on, you may want to bring all that minutia because they're going to ask you about it. But if we're just talking about the general display, and, and that's obviously an example of where the subject matter approach is the most important thing. For most people though, they don't necessarily want it. And I can tell you, having been a judge and a judge's coordinator, I have been given 60 page documentation that I was expected to read in 15 minutes. And while I did my best to speed read through it, it was very much lost on me in the moment of judging. Now after the, or in the moment of the, the evaluation, not the judging, I read it afterwards, right? But you don't want to throw everything at them. You want to highlight the key, most interesting and exciting points, phases, processes, whatever. Um, yep, it says like a cooking show, 
have pieces at crucial steps in the process. Absolutely. And people love to see tools. It's, I, you know, people are fascinated by technology and tools. Audette says, for an a &S competition with a display, sometimes it is enough to have the minutia there to reference, if needed, but it doesn't have to be on the table. Tuck it away in a box underneath, for example, and pull it out and discussion questions head in that direction. That's actually a very, very good point. And we'll see that with Audette and other people's displays when you get to the, the fun part of this, the presentation, which are the pictures. So I'm trying to move these boxes, so hopefully I won't be blocking you guys. I apologize about that. So let's see, we're talking about gathering your visuals. Um, consider what's really interesting to you, visually speaking, and then you basically want to create that wow factor. Now, wow isn't necessarily beautiful, but it's interesting. Sometimes it's a curiosity. Sometimes it's something really, really unique. You've never seen it before. So it's not necessarily beautiful in a conventional sense, but it sure did grab my attention. Additionally, when you're gathering your visuals for either your display or your demonstration, and when appropriate for the venue, you might want to use both traditional media as well as digital media. And I'll show you some examples of that in the future, in the, the uh, end of the show, screen show. Um, when you're putting visuals in there, if those pictures don't belong to you, make sure you are properly citing, attributing, and when, when appropriate, getting permission from whoever took that picture or created that image or likeness that you can use it. Even if that's for education, you can't just take other people's images and use it. As I mentioned at the beginning of this, I made sure everybody was okay with me using their displays and the few images that I put in here either are um, open source, common, we can, public domain, anybody can take them or they're images that I took myself. Additionally with visuals, even though they're intended to be visuals, you need to consider what you're okay with people touching. If you're not okay with somebody touching it, you're going to need to consider when you get to this, the phase where you're setting up your display, how you're going to safeguard that item. The last two tips or suggestions that I have here um, are gonna need a little bit more information, but I wanna give you a little background very quickly. I recently took a class on um, a website called edx.org. And it was a class from Harvard University. It was an online class called Tangible Things. And in that class, it essentially tells you how to think about displaying your items, okay? Also, one of the exercises in that class was basically something called the museum in a box. So it's, it's a quick seven minute video, but it was so profound to me that I want to share at least part of this video with you because it's gonna maybe hopefully get you to think a little bit differently about how you're going to make your display. I see something in the chat. Tagging onto Audette, yes, I have a bin where I keep a binder, printed images, pieces and process, tools, example, and it just comes along anytime I do a class or display on that topic. Excellent, excellent, excellent. All right, so if you're interested in this class, it's actually a free class. Um, it's edx.org. If you go into it and you search tangible things, this is what will come up. This is a class that I did over many weeks. There's a lot of elements to it. However, if you're really super serious about how you're thinking about things and how you want to display things and how you want to connect with and how you want other people to connect with the things you hope to show them in a different way, I highly recommend this course. Not sponsored, just want to pass that on. So this is the video. I'm going to attempt to show it. Hopefully it will work well. We tested it. If there's any problems, let me know in the chat. So it's an eight minute long video and I really thought about not including it. However, I felt like that particular video and really the course in general really challenged me to think about the things that I wanted to present, right? So if somebody said to you, okay, you need to make an exhibit about chairs, you might think, how am I going to do this? How am I going to make this interesting? How am I going to make this compelling? How do I tell a story? Obviously, chairs are extremely relatable to people, but then when you start thinking about it from other people's disciplines, and that's why I said consider cross-disciplinary approaches, you suddenly start beginning to tell or, or learning yourself these very interesting stories about the complexities of the, either the object that you're hoping to display, the art, the method, the science, the craft, the historical time period. You need to think about things in a different way than you tend to think about. How would somebody else think about it? If you were going to present this to somebody else who was from this particular discipline, what would they find interesting? The most effective displays are going to make whatever it is that you're trying to display or demonstrate relatable to others. 
the other main thing that was really profound to me in terms of changing how I thought about things uh, was an exercise within that tangible things course, which was called a museum in a box. And basically it was a challenge to you. If you're thinking about creating a display, or even if you're thinking about demonstrating something, if you were going to display or demonstrate something, but the challenge to you was that you could not say a word or put any written content out there, how would you still tell the story of whatever it is that you wanted to display or demonstrate? Which objects, which tools, which images would you use to include, to try to tell the whole story, almost like a Pictionary, right? How do you convey something if we're only using visuals? This exercise is really great if you're struggling with coming up with good visuals for what it is that you are trying to display. If you have something that's particularly challenging, try to do this exercise because I'll tell you, you'll find a lot of things that you may not have thought about before. Will your audience learn about your topic? Will they make new connections or associations? And will your visuals encourage them to explore further? So I have just a couple of images that I threw together as an exercise for something that I was considering. This is the first image. I'm gonna give you no words. I'm just gonna kind of go through them. Okay, so there's all the images, just a really quick exercise, grabbing six or seven images together. Can anybody guess what I am trying to teach you about or display to you? Well, knowing you, I would say it's um, having to do ink and prints onto fabric. Correct, it's about block printing. So what's interesting to me is if I saw this initially, without having done the research and without having done this exercise, I would not have known what this was, I would not have known what this was, and I would not have known what this was. This is woad. It would be used to dye the fabrics and in some cases put pigment onto the, the fabric. This is a nitty knotty with some linen thread. This is a wooden printing block. And this is a linen block printed or a fustian block printed textile at the V&A Museum. This is a sculpture of Cennini, with, which if you're familiar with block printing, is known uh, very much because he was one of the few people that documented how to create inks and pigments for block printing and gilding of fabrics. So he's very important in the study of block printing. This is a modern picture, so how does it relate to the, the Middle Ages? Well, this man is Robert Ferrer, and he was one of the earliest uh, scholars to really study block printing. He ended up getting a whole lot wrong and that's okay. He brought a lot of attention and spotlight to the field of block printing and that's why he is important to the field itself. And this right here is actually lamp black and that is an essential part to block printing when you're printing in black. This one happens to be in a red ochre. Oftentimes block printing is actually in black. So, so moving on to step four, you've gathered up all your visuals. What else do you need? Which other elements do you need in order to tell your story to the people that are going to come see your display or view and watch your demonstration? Think about the other things that appeal to different senses. Anything that people can touch that you're comfortable with them touching. Knowing full well, full well it could possibly get broken, ruined, or otherwise unserviceable or unusable for whatever it is you want to use. Things that they can taste. Be careful when you do this. Obviously, you need to follow very closely any health and safety guidelines. You also need to make sure, especially in today's day and age, we'll say several months from now, anything that people are gonna be touching, tasting, getting close to, you're gonna need to think about how can they do that in a safe way for you, for them, and for anybody else that's attending it. But you're gonna to wanna to think about how can people engage with, encounter, in, um, be a part of this story in ways other than visual. Any things that they can smell, but be careful not to be overwhelming with anything that smells, and anything that they can listen or hear. You want to try to make your display interactive in some form. Now, that does not necessarily mean hands-on, though hands-on, as we talked about, is an extremely effective approach. It is very, very good in terms of retention, 
you know, making people have a, feel like they have a stake in it and being interested. But an interactive experience could be a hands-on display or an exhibit or demonstration. It could be interactive in that, um, for example, I was at a Viking reenactment group and we were showing how to tablet weave. And so I had the entire thing that was warped up and ready. And as people came in, they were actually able to weave as many lines as they wanted. And we could kind of uh, afford as people rotated in and out towards the demonstration. They didn't necessarily take that home with them, but they got to actually be a part of making something. Then there's a make it and take it. So maybe I had it set up that people could actually learn right there, they'd weave a couple of lines and then they would leave with a little tablet woven thing. And I have done that as well too. It could be that you are physically demonstrating something. You are sewing, you are um, smithing, you are um, carving something, right? So it's interactive in that as you're doing it, you're talking to them about what it is you're doing. You're answering their questions. As appropriate, you let them get in and get close and see exactly, look at this detail right here, let me show you what I'm carving. That is an interactive way without necessarily being a hands-on thing. You could also, in some fashion, do a scientific experiment. Um, a, a quick and easy example that comes to mind is that you could show what the process is of woad adhering to fabric. When you draw woad, or excuse me, fabric out of a woad vat, whether it's a traditional SIG vat or whether you have a modern chemical synthetical vat, for the first few seconds that the woad comes up, it's this yellowish, greenish, grayish color. It's not very appealing. And then suddenly, boom, magic happens. And it's this bright, beautiful, wonderful blue. So you can show them one element or one really cool thing about why something works. You could also do a planned show or performance, and this is very common with um, demonstrations in general. You kind of have your shtick, you have your spiel, you know what you're going to tell. You, you want to include a little bit of information. Remember, don't overwhelm them. People will ask you questions if they want to know more information. They'll come up to you afterwards and say, hey, can I get your email address, or are you on Facebook, or is there a website I can go to? If people want more, they'll ask you for more. Um, but you want to give them enough to get them interested. You want them to have their curiosity peaked. They, you want them to feel motivated and inspired to explore whatever it is you're trying to display or demonstrate in front of them after they leave. So um, subject matter is interesting and relatable is an important element in terms of how you're telling your story. For example, there's a reason why you find this interesting. We talked about that earlier. You need to highlight fun unique or really weird odd facts. People love that kind of stuff. You also want to try to relate historical activities with modern ones, whether there's odd modern day practices or colloquialisms like, Daddy, mommy. Oh, are you going to bed? Not Excuse yet. me real quick. Good night. He's not going to bed. Not, quite not yet. yet. Okay. Trying to get him to <laughs> eat a sandwich. All right. So, Relate historical activities. So uh, modern day practices. Why do we, why do dr cars drive on the left side in England and the right side in America? Stories like that and information that helps people relate to, like, oh man, I didn't know that. Um, when people say the phrase, uh, too poor to have a pot to piss in, right? Well, okay, I, I've heard that phrase. I've heard people say it before. I don't exactly know what it means. Well, let me show you how my art, craft, science, method, research, whatever it is, relates that and can explain that. So basically relating historical things to modern day contexts is a lot of fun for people. There are shows like Dirty Jobs and How It's Made that show that nitty gritty. Remember earlier we were talking about something that's intentionally deconstructed or ugly or destroyed in some fashion? Don't be afraid to take your whole thing apart and show people what's inside, how is it made, what what processes went in? What are the unseen elements? Again, remember, that's not necessarily visually beautiful, but it is appealing. And then this is always fun. Uh, if you're trying to relate historical things to modern day ones, um, you could always try the, the method of, if you were in the zombie apocalypse, how would you use this item, skill, knowledge uh, to, to get ahead? That is a fun and appealing thing that works in a lot of general public contexts. So, make sure 
So in terms of it being educational and informative, I just want to make sure the audience should learn something new. They should look at your subject a little bit differently when you're done with them. You want to pique their curiosity, but remember just tidbits, small bite-sized pieces, don't overwhelm them. And you obviously want to encourage them to keep trying things out. All right, step five. So you've gathered up your visuals. You've thought about the other things you're gonna to want to include in your uh, display or demonstration. Now you think about where, what am I missing? Where are my gaps? What have I forgotten about? Which step or unique piece of information have I not featured yet? And that picture box or museum in a box um, thing really gets you to think about all the steps. Like if you're trying to get 50 pictures about a topic, you're gonna to try hard to think about what else. And that will sometimes cue you into, oh, I didn't even think. I could put the, the original uh, fabric next to the dyed fabric. You, know, you will think about things and it'll be cue you into including things to feel, touch, see, whatever, um, that maybe you didn't think about or wouldn't have thought about before. Also, this is really important, and I did touch on this a little bit earlier when we were talking about approaches for different audiences. In any context, you need to consider accessibility. That means anybody that has perhaps a physical disability, neurodevelopmental or cognitive disabilities, anybody that is deaf or hard of hearing, how are you going to do, how are you going to convey information at your display if somebody cannot hear you or can't hear you well? How do you share that information? How do you get them excited? Now, written things are helpful, but if it's not just that, if you're actually able to demonstrate something in front of them or show them pictures of that process, that will still speak to them. And the most important thing about when you consider accessibility to things, it ends up improving your entire display or demonstration for everyone. Rarely when you make some sort of accommodation or accessibility consideration, is it going to harm your your um, exhibit. When I was speaking to Elizabeth earlier, she said, you know, if, if I make sure that my font is very big so that somebody that may have a um, uh, seeing issue or disability sight issue, uh, that person over there is going to appreciate the bigger font too because they can read it easier. They don't have to get three feet up. They can stand five feet back or whatever. So Consider accessibility. Think about the audiences that are so often not considered because A, it's the right thing to do, and B, it's going to make your display all around better. Consider your layout. Establish it, right? Step six, you need to consider the space available. Sometimes when you're creating your display, you have no idea what you're going to get. Sometimes you're told, oh, you'll have like a table that's about six feet long or wide and three or four feet deep, and you think, okay, but Trust me when I say this, you need to plan for less space than you're told to expect or that you might hope for. And you need to make plan A, B, C, D, and E about which things you're gonna pull out and cut out if you only have a limited amount of space or not as much space as you thought you were going to have. I also want you to think about and consider your navigability around your display or demo, not just for people that may have, um, that may utilize a wheelchair or other mobility aids, but anybody to be able to get in and around things without knocking stuff over or, feeling overwhelmed. Sometimes you don't have any control over your environment. You're put in a corner in the middle of a crowded gym and you just got to work with what you can work with. But if all things are equal and you have the opportunity to consider how you want to make your format and your flow of things, you need to even think about where are you going to stand? Are you going to be present with it? If you're present, where are you at? Are you acting basically as a docent to guide people through your display? Or are you just standing off to the side watching people? Or are you actively displaying something in a, or actually actively demonstrating some part of your art, science, craft, or subject matter that you want others to be a part of? The last thing is I want you to think about- oh, you quick, Shazada yeah. posted something in the chat. Let me see if I can- Do see. you want me to read it or- Yes, please. Um, she said, or um, I also always keep in mind that people may have difficulty seeing certain colors next to each other or on top of each other. For example, red text on a green background, I try to keep contrast and color choice in mind. That's great. That is an excellent point. Thank you. So in terms of your display, when you're establishing and thinking about your layout, you want to think about display tools such as stands, platforms, uh, signs, frames, tablecloths, and you'll get to see a lot of that in just a second. 
Um, really quickly, I want to put this out there. I have an Amazon shop. If you go to this website and you click this very th first thing down here, display tools, it is essentially a Pinterest page, but on Amazon of a whole bunch of different stands and tools and things of that sort that you can um, possibly use. Fair warning, this isn't an a associate site I do or affiliate site. I do make money, not very much, but I make you know a couple of pennies here and there. That's not why I'm sharing it. I'm not trying to make money. You don't have to buy anything through my link. But if you want to steal some of my ideas, you can. Um, I'm going to show you really quickly some things for you to think about. So when you click on display tools, it'll show you different things that you can consider, including in your display. And you'll see a lot of examples of this. All kinds of things that you can either dress down, dress up, utilize, cover, make your own. But these are just, this list basically is intended to give you some ideas, um, some food for thought. So step seven is you're assembling your display. You're putting everything together. First things first, define your budget in advance. It's really easy to get carried away and go well beyond what you need to. And while I'm all about making the best display possible, be reasonable, set your your budget in advance and i'm going to give you a couple of tips on how you can get things cheaper or do things a little bit more economically my number one tip is go to the household and bric-a-brac departments especially at secondhand stores you can find so many of those things that i showed you on the amazon list um, that you could utilize and incorporate into your display or demonstration in very effective ways for super cheap 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 in fact one of the persons I'll show you her display. I'll point it out when we get there. Um, I, it was this beautiful display. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you when I get there. So just know that if you regularly check in at your secondhand stores in the household or bric-a-brac departments, you will find a lot of stuff. Additionally, I put solicit item donations for others. And what I mean by this is, hey guys, um, Aveline is making a class or display on period sewing tools, and I have heard that uh, boar's hairs are used for, or were used at one point for sewing. I, I've looked online, I can't find anybody that sells boar's hairs, or the ones I've found are like 50 bucks and I just can't afford. Does anybody know somebody that has a boar or has boar's hairs or whatever? I put the shout out out within, I think, two hours. I had a uh, Skadian from Kaid contact me and say, hey, I make shoes and I have a bunch of leftover boar bristles that actually have the linen attached to it so you can actually see how it would have been used as a needle. Um, we use, obviously use it a little differently for shoes, but I'm happy to send you my clippings of basically spent boar's hairs that I don't do anything with, but now it's an effective tool for you. A lot of times people are willing to give or contribute in some fashion, especially if they know it's for educational purposes. People want to be a part of that. They're excited too. So don't be afraid to ask like, hey, can anybody help me out? Does anybody have an extra crate that I can use for my display? Or does anybody have an extra um, log of wood that I can show? I, you know, I don't have this particular wood anymore because I carved my thing, but I'd love to see the original. Don't be afraid to ask others. Additionally, when you're assembling your display, make sure you look at your display from five feet away, from 10 feet away, and from 50 feet away. And that will give you a different perspective each time and will help you sort of think about, okay, what do I need to tweak, change, or otherwise add to my display or demonstration to make it visually appealing, to make it not seem intimidating, you don't want to overwhelm people, and to make it seem like it's navigable to those that might want to come kind of head on over and see things. Elizabeth said, thank you. She needs to add this to her thrifting class. <laughs> I'm happy to share. Just don't take, don't go to my local stores where I go. <laughs> so here are a couple of additional tips to create visual appeal. Add a title board. You don't always have to do this. Some people prefer not to do this, but I find that it tends to yield those that might feel a little timid or shy about coming up because they're not exactly sure if they want to get into a conversation. Now they know, oh, actually I do. That's very interesting to me or, or I want to know more about that. Make sure that any written content intended to be part of your display, not necessarily your handouts or your documentation, is readable from at least five feet away. And I think 10 feet is the better rule. 
People love infographics. So when it is appropriate to include it, sometimes you're going for full immersion. You're not gonna wanna include infographics if you're doing full immersion, right? But people love charts, or not charts, but um, infographics. They love, you know, different things that very quickly tell them with the sort of scanning of the eye what the information is. It also makes it easily digestible and it makes it memorable. They're more likely to remember it if they see some sort of graphic. When it comes to colors, consider your color palette and try to keep it either go with a three color pack palette. You've got a neutral, you've got a light shade of a color, and then you've got a darker shade of a color, right? And this is for your design decorative elements, not necessarily the things you're incorporating in it. Or if appropriate, you just go full on rainbow, but you make sure you're full on rainbow, right? You don't want a bunch of different colors that don't seem to have any rhyme or reason and become visually kind of overwhelming and honestly gross. Um, and obviously we talked about this earlier, don't include too much. Keep your display uncluttered with visually dynamic arrangements. And what I mean by visually dynamic is usually height. So different things, different ways are shown in different formats. And I'll point that out as we go along. The last step is play test your display. Your friends will be great at telling you what was boring, what was hard to see, what was difficult to read and what they just couldn't understand or really kind of didn't appeal to them. And now we're going to get into my favorite part of the class, which is looking at everybody's pretties. The first three are going to be my displays. Two of them um, I intend on us to pick on. The third you can certainly pick on if you want, but I felt I did a little bit better and I'll talk about what I did differently and why. And then we're going to get into everybody else's and then we will open it up to discussion. So I was a baby. I just started in the SCA and um, Lynn, let me know if this image that I, or this screen that I have up in this area is blocking the view, but I, that's the chat so I can it, pause if people need me to. Is it blocking? Yes, but right now it looks like it's just carpet next to a chair and a table. Yeah. Okay, then I'm going to, I'm going to exit out of my chat. You'll just have to stop me every once in a while and that way it doesn't block anything. So I was a baby. I think this was my third event. I had been doing the SCA for about six months. And this was the first time that I attempted, or in fact did, dye with a fermented urine or SIG vat with Wode. Um, I had great documentation, I felt. Um, but if you look at this, it's pretty boring and drab and it's really forgettable. It's really easy to kind of walk by this and go, oh, okay, she did something with fabric and some kind of liquids and okay, I'm done, right? So, and that's okay. There's, there's nothing wrong with starting this. I think there were some elements that were kind of smart. I tried to do more immersion by putting the fabric over top of these um, mason jars to make it look a little more period. These ones weren't originally intended to be out, which is why they weren't covered. And then somebody asked me to pull them out, so they, they are here. Uh, but these were the three that were originally there. I had a mortar and pestle to show how I ground up some of the woad. I had some weld here that was um, actually water sol soluble in it. I had the intended design with other fibers. I was gonna weave, tablet weave with these two um, skeins of silk, but the intended design was right here as was the pattern. And then here was the example of what I was going for. And then here is all my documentation. So. Is it terrible? No. Is it boring? Yes. This is actually much more recent, but it was a very limited um, space. So this was for the Mid-Realms Tournament of Arts, and essentially it was you are meeting with a Laurel one-on-one -on -one to talk about some subject or topic that you define. You can show them some of your things, and then you guys will talk. So the challenge that we had was this space was, I think, maybe three or four feet wide. And this was pretty narrow. I think they were only about two and a half feet deep. And then one person, me, had to sit here and the other person had to sit here. So I couldn't put a lot of stuff in the middle. So essentially, I used picture frames around the outside to show the finished product. Over here, I have a picture of the extant piece. Here, I have a picture of the block that I had carved. And then here, I have my initial test with what went wrong. And then here I had the second try. This was the first try, which was effective. And then I was trying something different as I continued to progress in this exploration of reproduction. 
And then here is all my documentation, which actually had a lot more pictures that is not seen right here. So I also um, provided the, the uh, tablecloth. So it was just a red tablecloth that I got from a thrift store. A neutral color, like a tan or beige, a red, depending on what you're showing, and a black are usually your best bets. White tends to be a nightmare for a variety of reasons, so I would recommend against it unless you just think it's the best thing for it and you don't mind your <laughs> tablecloth probably getting ruined. In this instance, too, I, I had che checked that the red fabric of this and this red fabric weren't going to clash too much in being two different tonalities. Again, if I had more space, I would have done a lot more with it and more of my visuals were put right here, but when you're working with a limited thing, you kind of got to work with what you got. In the chat, Shazada said that if I have a lot of visuals going on with lots of different colors and textures, I always have a base color to tie it all together, as well as a tie-in color. For example, a teal background with bits of gold here and there to tie the base and the top together for a story. This way, if you have a lot of visuals, it all comes together and is still vibrant, but not overwhelming. That, yeah, that's excellent. And it's kind of following that three, three color rule. So this is the third display that I did. This was a few years ago at an event where it was, um, I was competing for most educational hands-on display. And this was intended to be a display for Viking period textile tools and a couple of other domestic tools were put in there as well. So I have here five different needles. There are all reproductions of Viking Age needles, uh, the actual material that was used during the Viking Age with documentation up here about when it was used. I also have a nail bending needle right here. And then I put some scrap linen. I used my embroidery machine to embroider the metal of the needle that was attached to it. And then people were able to come by and pick these up and sew with them and kind of get a feel for what is it like to sew with an iron needle? What is it like to sew with a brass or a bone? Uh, a little more difficult because it's got a big fat head. Up here were some more tools. Over here, you can see other tools. Um, oh, here's a close up. So this is a pinning bone. This was a pump of wax. You know, I'm not gonna go through all these things, but basically I tried to create um, different levels. And here, you know, this is, this is in fact a sewing box, which is similar to this Oseberg box, but it also used it as a platform to put things on top of. Uh, some other tools. Here's another thing. I wasn't necessarily going to be present all day. I wanted to attend some classes and we weren't supposed to be present for some of the judging. It was supposed to be basically a standalone. So I made sure to put this here. So it gave people a little bit of education about what they were seeing in front of them and where it came from. And then also giving them the visual, where are these different places at? Additionally, I did have these signs out everywhere, which basically feel free to pick up stuff, try it, cut things, give it a, give, give it a hand. And then if you wanna get a hold of me, look for Lady Avalina Sharesbrook from the Barony of Shadowed Stars, my old Barony. Elizabeth said that she likes that you have the please touch instructions. Yes, and I have I highlighted that on a couple of people, but I think that is important, especially if you're not going to be with your uh, display all day. If you have stuff out, most people, especially if you're not around, are going to touch your stuff. But some people won't because they want to make sure to be respectful because you're not there to ask. So if you want to encourage people, put those signs out. I had scraps of fabric that people could grab and they could see what it was like to cut with the different scissors. I also had a whalebone plaque uh, replica here with the fabric and then this bucket actually had water in it that people could try to iron the linen with and they could see where it came from. So um, if anybody has any suggestions, comments, things they would have improved on any of these exhibits of mine or displays of mine, by all means go ahead and put them in here for a little bit of conversation. But while you're typing that up, we'll come back to it in a bit. I'm going to move on because we're at about 8.15. So this is the image that I was at the beginning of the um, class and it was one of the most visually striking things that I have seen in a while. It's a beautiful display by the Honorable Lady Audette um, of the Mid-Realm. And this is a display about knitting. And I don't know if it's just me, but whenever I see a big beautiful leg in the middle of things, it always makes me think of Christmas story. And of course I uh, immediately related to it. And obviously as a person who wears stockings, 
seeing them just laid out on tables is not nearly the same as seeing them on a person or on a display. And this was very effective, especially with this beautiful bright red. Additionally, she used like a jewelry holder to have some pairs of socks that were up here, as well as some more um, motifs down here. <clears throat> this was very interesting. So this is a sampler of different heels that may have been knitted depending on time and place. So each color is a different example of a different heel. So people could look it up, they could pick it, they could fondle it, they could, you know, look at the different uh, knitting <clears throat> uh, weaves and go from there. I, I thought that was really quite brilliant. She also had some of her knitting needles as well as some other materials here, or tools. She showed um, how she could knit extremely, extremely tiny and some of the um, thread that she used there. And she had her documentation up here on a stand so that it wasn't laying flat and taking up table space and it was very visually dynamic. So Adette, if you have anything else that you want to comment about your display or your thoughts, things you want to share, by all means, go ahead and type it in the chat as well. So this exhibit or display was by Pierre Geneviève de Vaucresson, who ended up becoming the um, Royal Majesty's Seto Inanez's Arts and Sciences Champion as a result of this, ex of this display. And she had a number of really gorgeous things that were also off to the right of this table. I'm not going to feature all of them in the interest of time. However, this is an example of the wow factor, right? It is so incredibly visually stunning. Not only is it there so you can look at it, she did have a sign, please don't touch, and that's fair. She had this great dress form um, with the partlet on it that really kind of brought it to life. And she did have a little bit of documentation and information sort of clipped right here to it so that you can see it and learn more about it as you were up close and personal and could view it. Here's another example of somebody that did some um, costuming, some gowns. So not only did she wear herself what she was teaching about, she also had these incredible little dolls that she got, um, which she made mini replicas of, and people could come by, they could pick them up, they could lift up the layers, they could see how it was attached, and they could really kind of look at it in proportion of things. And this particular exhibit was about flat drafting versus draping and how the patterns were possibly made in the Eleonora de Toledo burial gown as well as the uh, Crimson Pisa dress. And then she had some of her books out, right? So again, if it's a tougher topic to talk about, and this was more about her research, you put out things that were part of the process. And certainly research was a distinct part of this process. Another example, just like Leonora had the dolls, um, Baroness Jahanara had the Hina dolls, which are a Japanese doll that had actual Japanese um, scaled clothing on them in order to demonstrate some things. I thought that was a beautiful example. Um, the Honorable Lady Drush Aleon from Kaid had this great, um, very straightforward, and, I, and I'm going to say simple, not that it was not beautiful, but it was clean. It was very straightforward. You knew what you were looking at. It was very engaging. Not only did she have the like three poster board backdrop here for the vertical dynamic, she also had a digital picture frame right here, which rotated through some of the other um, elements that she wanted to showcase and feature. She, just like me, had a big old fat sign that said, please touch, touch me. And while she was present for a lot of that day, she wasn't always present. And that was a great thing because people felt like they could be involved and engaged. She furthermore had a comment book right here, which is a great idea because then it gives you feedback. And if people want more information, they can just put it here. And she had her business card so that you could get more information or couldn't stay in touch with her as well as copies of documentation that anybody walking by could, could gladly grab. This is Baroness Haldora. She actually won the uh, Laurel Choice, Laurel's Choice Award for this particular event. And this is a display on period Viking foods and spices and herbs. A lot of these things, she can easily just pop back into Ziploc bags and store in between all of the um, times that she does ha have this display or demonstration out. I know personally that she would spend, I think like a grand total of maybe nine bucks to get some fresh produce to really uh, add that element. These eggs actually have a little teeny puncture in them so that they are viable to go from event to event to event. 
Uh, but for the most part, a lot of these things were dried goods that she wouldn't have to necessarily reinvest every single time she wanted to put this. She is also the woman that I mentioned earlier who thrifted almost everything that you're seeing on this table for incredibly low prices. These little dishes right here are actually the bottom dishes of some plant pots. You know what I'm talking about? That sort of terracotta. And I think she got them for like dimes, right? But they make such a visually striking and incredible image. She also, I think this is one of the things that she had purchased or already had in her collection. She used these glasses and then she used little scraps of fabric that she then dunked in warm beeswax and then shaped to basically be lids to the oils that might have been used, which really gives that immersive type effect. And she, like Jerusha and others, had her business card out there so people could stay in touch with her, could connect with her, could go back to her for more information, um, even though she was there for most of it to really kind of walk people through the display itself. This is another great display about food. So the artist, instead of putting necessarily just a photograph, she actually did her own illustration. She also had fresh radishes out here as well as pickled radishes. She had some um, powder and some seeds and some other things. And then she had her documentation. She had, sorry, the hiccups. She had a grand total, I think of like two feet to work with. <laughs> so, so again, sometimes you don't have a lot out there, but what you do have is really quite impactful. Same person, um, Lady. Oh, sorry, yes. real quick. Oh, okay. Audette said um, she remembers being told height is good at some point regarding displays. So when she got that leg, she just had to use it. The giggles <laughs> alone were worth it. And Elizabeth said that she was the Laurel who had made that challenge. Oh, a couple oh. slides ago. Good pick. I love that ex that display too. So, um. Same artist as the one before. This is Lady Isabel of Carnarvon of Atlantia. She has this beautiful, very teeny tiny, I think it's like um, a foot and a half or two and a half, two foot and a half or two by a foot and a half or two wide space to work with. So this is about apothecary wares. And so she's got the mortar and pestle and some powders and some salves and some um, uh, beeswax candles. So, and also very effective use of vertical space in an otherwise very teeny tiny spot. This is not from a reenactor, although when I contacted them to get permission to use this, they got very excited about reenacting because they were excited that somebody else was excited about their display. So that's a funny little uh, side note. This is from a Facebook page called Foraged Fibers. She's in the United Kingdom and she actually goes everywhere she can and um, takes different um, cellulose fibers and attempts to, to uh, spin them to create a thread or a cord, and then she dyed them with all natural things in the same areas. And this was a beautiful display that she has. Very simple, basically in a shadow box, it's a couple feet tall, where people can you know, reach out, they can grab them, they can pick them up, they can feel them, they can smell them, they can put them back where they were and then grab the next thing. I just thought that was really a really great visual thing. Laura Mother Alfrun Keta of Ethelmark has this really, fantastic thing. And I have two pictures of this in different iterations. It's a, it's a great display for a number of reasons, but the main reason I wanted to focus on it was this right here. It is, for all intents and purposes, a miniature reproduction of a uh, weighted warp loom, uh, warp weighted loom, excuse me. So, for those who can't necessarily understand what that means or don't really conceptualize what it means when they're looking at a 2D picture, when you see it in 3D all warped up and how it works, and she can actually utilize this to show you. So you can see here she's woven some of the weft itself right there. Anytime you can use effectively miniatures or reproductions, you are going to have uh, a much more positive response. It's a, it's a visceral response. It also helps people that have 2D processing issues to understand what they're seeing, and it's a lot of fun. Same thing here, but she also included hmm, some of the fibers from some of the sheep. So she's got the picture of the sheep here, and then she has actual uh, fleece from each of the sheep to show you what that looks like, and that was just really incredible. Super simple, right, in terms of the complexity of the design, it's not an over complex thing, but wow, is that super impactful. 
This is actually from Lynn, who is our host this evening. She did a great black work embroidery display at um, a recent event, I think, in, was this in Flaming Griffin, Lynn? It's the Craftsperson's Fair um, for um, Christmas tourney. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to tell you what I love about it, and then Lynn, if you want to add anything, please do. So there's a couple things that are amazing about this. Number one, she's got the embroidery frame right here with active embroidery. That makes it really relatable. And again, whenever you can have an object there, or a tool for your trade, that is exciting to people. Number two, she has these samplers right here with different stitches. Again, pick them up, feel them, or look at them really closely. You can see the various things. And I think you have the information, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but she had information about where some of these things came from. Both of these samplers are really awesome. And she had this great little stand where she had this in a very limited space. She used, you know, this necklace holder to show a, a neck or partlet piece. She should use this head to use, show the coif. And then she showed the, used this little stand here, which is this a ruler and another ruler? It looks like you can fill us in, Lynn. But she has this uh, shirt and cuffs that are featured. And again, very limited space. Do you have anything you want to add about that, Lynn? I uh, guess. Um holding up the shirt my mom had given me it was a stand um, that has a ruler and it actually sits on the ground so when you're hemming a skirt you can actually use it to know like oh. on a dress dummy how high up you need it okay so it was a ruler already on a stand and so i just um, took a clear tape and taped another ruler to create a t to put the shirt on that way it was up off the table because beautiful and effective yeah, I loved it. we were given three feet of space, and I'm like, yeah. I have a lot of stuff. How do I fit it all in there? Right, and that's really smart. So basically, you used a vertical space that didn't even really take up any of the three-foot surface area because it was essentially behind it from the floor up right behind the whole thing, right? Yes. Yeah, smart. Now, her children, Jonathan and Haley Von Gleer, both did their own display right next to mom. And this was very cute too. And I wanted to show you the effective use of height. So they've got this on a stand, this on a stand, this is up on a box. They were smart and they put their own little handwritten tags that told you what it was. They also had pictures of them in the process of doing what they were doing. And they had their um, receipts or recipes and information and documentation. Anything else there, Lynn? Um, just a fun tip that that um, wooden box that they're using as a stand yeah. is actually what Reinhold likes to put his uh, his rapier stuff in to carry <laughs> out onto the field. So it was, you're fighting, it's an empty box, flip it over, now it's a stand. Perfect. Very smart. So you're, like I said earlier, your display does not have to cost you lots and lots of money. You can do things really easily and effectively by either using things from around you or kind of thrifting from uh, uh, thrift stores or objects that people aren't using or don't want at that moment. This is by Corazon of Star Hill and she does meadow, I never had, know how to say this word, repousse. I hope I'm saying that right. She had this space, which was, I think, three feet by three feet. This was, um, again, at the Arts and Sciences Champion Competition for Their Majesty's Seto and Inez. And she used really effective little stands. They're teeny tiny uh, stands that held up her objects. She also had a little sign next to some things because we were not to be present during some of the um, judging and viewing. So she had some information for those that might view it. And I thought this was really cool. She has this rock that actually had some copper. So again, it's, it's one piece of the pie, but it's relatable. It's something you can see. It's something you can pick up and touch and feel and, and be like, hey, I, I think I've seen something like that. Or you can actually say, wow, I never knew what copper looked like. You know, I always had this image of like suddenly these ingots appear, but now I know what they look like. And that's kind of cool. Magister Lucretia of the Mid-Realm uh, did a great display on all of the new and interesting things that she tried. Things that she isn't necessarily laureled for, but she was really trying to expand um, her, her areas of study and try new things out. And so she had a great display. I'm not going to show you the whole thing, but there were two things I kind of mentioned this earlier that I wanted to show you. So the first was that she did a bunch of hairstyles that were supposed to be Roman inspired. And so this is a traditional photo album with a bunch of pictures of hairstyles that she has done over the years. 
Then she had, it's a little blurry, I apologize, but she had a digital photo frame, which rotated with a bunch of information about other things that she tried out in different time periods and cultures and sort of documented her journey. And I thought that was really, really cool to see. Uh, Celera did this amazing thing at Penzik, and it is on 16th century Dutch German uh, glasswork, speakerware, right? So again, she's got the visual dynamics. She's got a little stand here. She's got a frame that's upright that shows some tools. She has two different heights of glass or plastic containers in which she has a bunch of the objects that have been made. It's, it makes it very visually dynamic and interesting to look at these two and then also look at them here. She had her documentation out here and over here she even had a little comment book much like Jerusha did earlier and then she had all of her tools and calipers and things like that that people could pick up and see. Um, this is from a different exhibit in which she didn't have the tools out. This is why she had the framed thing. So this is never a comfortable topic and it didn't necessarily apply to Celera but um, Sometimes people will walk away with your things. And if you cannot afford for that to happen, then you need to consider either you're gonna be present the entire day long, or you need a different way in which to feature them. So in this instance, I don't know if it was for space or being worried about her tools, but she did use an effective frame, which took a very little space on her table and created that visual dynamic to show the tools. At a different event, in this case, it was at Penzik, she did actually have all these tools out. And then here's her comment book. Again, beautifully decorated and organized and you knew exactly what it was when you saw it and left some feedback in for her. Uh, this is her documentation. She even tried to make sure that the binding matched the color of the frame. I mean, there's a lot of thought that went in here in terms of the decoration and trying to keep things to a minimum. If you go back up to this, she's got her basically three colors. She's got her neutral, She's got her browns and then she's got her greens, right? So she was very smart about the way she did it. So it didn't look cluttered and all over the place. And then there's this, which is not cluttered and all over the place, but oh my gosh, the wonderful, amazing colors. And a good reason to have these colors. So her later sh ladyship, excuse me, her ladyship Claire, it's just Claire La de Dier. Shouldn't be an O in there. Sorry about that. So her ladyship Claire, who actually owns uh, Dragon Dye Works, uh, did this uh, display on medieval and Renaissance period dyes. So you necessarily expect to see lots of colors. So not only does she have all these beautiful, vibrant colors of the products themselves, as well as what they yield, she also had some of the raw product down here. And I think she told me that she got these all at a uh, some of them she got at an Etsy shop and then some of them she got at a thrift store. She has some of her research books here and other books that are for those that are interested in this topic they might want to get. She has a bunch of her other research and documentation here as well as like different samples of different things that you can see, you know, different mordants, different fixatives, that sort of thing. And then she had, uh, I think these are some Murex snail shells that were in this case because she didn't want people either A, walking away with them or B, necessarily touching them. So something for you to think about. If you really want to display something, then in that Amazon list that I showed you, there are a number of plastic or plexiglass boxes, or you can try and build or purchase your own that are the nicer ones that look a little more period, whatever is in your budget and whatever will fit your aesthetic. So here's the display, but she also was really smart and had a digital PDF available for anybody that came by they could get this PDF. I don't know if she did a QR code or something else. So they could basically walk away with this amazing four panel PDF about most of the same things that you see up here. I thought that was brilliant. This is a scroll display and you're actually seeing two different variants of the same display with different things being featured and only different parts of it being used. So it's actually three different panels this the art the scrolls were actually by Mestre Esperanza of Atlantia and then the display itself was built by Baron Morris and uh, Lady Azar. So it's actually three different panels or in this case she just has two of them together and then it's got all these chains with different clips and you'll see in a second how it works and then she could hook on all of her framed scrolls or illustrations 
in different variations and organizations to fit whatever it is was that she wanted to display. She also made sure to have a little title board, which I think was effective. And then here you can actually see the whole thing broken down, breaks down on this. Here's her baggie of the hardware that goes with it as well as the tool. And uh, she said all that fit into basically a little tote. And this is really, I think probably the most memorable for me display that I have ever seen. I've also seen it as both a display where it was just a, I come by and I look at things as well as a demonstration with uh, people in it talking and showing some of the, the living day-to-day -day things that would have been done or utilized in this. This is a Sutton Who display by Duke Talamar of the Midrealm. Um, don't fret professionally. He does, he's a curator uh, and does exhibits for museums. So this is the, uh, a really a level of caliber that um, I would love to be at one day. I'm not at it, right? But that what was so really tremendous to me was the level of immersion that was put into this. This took up, I think, um, maybe 15 or 20 feet wide by probably 10 or 15 feet deep. And it was roped off. This was at uh, the SCA 50 year, I think. I think it was also at the mid realm. It may have been at the mid realm 50 year, but it was definitely at the SCA 50 year. And this entire display is to feature things from a specific Anglo Saxon period that would have been in somebody's home for daily life, as well as what the people that would go out and be fighting may have worn. And I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna narrate all of it. I'm just gonna kind of slowly take you through, um, you know, the, she, he had somebody weave this. It's really just stunning. He's got somebody sleeping. He's got some of the knickknacks that they would have had around them, the hat, the shoes, um, cups or uh, oil, oil lamps. His helm, he's got a game board over here. He's got plateware. He's got buckets that are made period wise. This is made with all period techniques and uh, materials. This is stunning. Not, I mean, what can you say about this other than it's uh, fantastic, right? It's great to see. Um, here is a little different display that he has done where it just featured some of the metal hardware of the time period. And then here, this is actually at a library where he was asked to create um, an exhibit. And so this kind of took place along the wall of the library. Um, it's actually one straight wall, but the two pictures are taken from two different angles. So he has people, again, daily living from the Viking through Anglo-Saxon time period. And this is a big <laughs> warp weighted loom. Uh, not everybody can trek that everywhere you go, but this is fantastic to see, right? And then again, period made, materials on uh, mannequins or dress forms in order to articulate what it might have looked like. So those are all of the goodies that I saw that I wanted to share with you in terms of some of the most spectacular displays, demonstrations, exhibits that I have seen specifically within the context almost exclusively of the SCA or at least living historians, reenactors from other groups. Um, Elizabeth says, I think one of the most important things to remember is that creating displays is a process. Thank you. We we're just about to get to that. If you get really into something, you're probably not going to display it just once. So you don't have to get it perfect the first time, but you can improve it a bit, bit by bit over time. And you can collect your display frameworks as well as your displays items over time. Exactly. Don't feel like you need to start out doing a display like Duke Talamar, <laughs> right? You can start out doing a display like Aveline, which was not great, wasn't terrible, but it wasn't great. And I have slowly built up on different subjects and topics over time, um, those things. Yes, Duke Talamar's display was a recreation of the Sutton Hoo burial, correct. That was the Sutton Hoo, that was the first one. The last picture of the two one was not, that was just general Anglo-Saxon to Viking period living. So, we have about 15 minutes. Do we have any other questions, comments, suggestions, tips? Um, if you need something specific like a head to display your piece, use a coupon or Joann's or Michael's for your purchase. No sense in paying full price when you can get it 40% off. I never pay full price, but I'm glad you 
put that out there. That's great. And you can also use Hobby Lobby coupons at Joann's, 40% off anytime. So one of the nice things that I saw, some of the people did and some didn't, and that's okay. But I think it's something I want to work on is I have, um, I have this lovely, from my last class, I haven't done anything with it. So I have this mannequin head, right? It's kind of spooky and freaky, but not everybody has these lifelike ones. And maybe you don't necessarily even want a lifelike one. One of the things I've seen people do is put like a velvet or a nice plushy fabric over it to then focus less on the person's face, whether it's a foam face, whether it's a lifelike face, or whether it's just a white blob, and then focus on whatever the headwear or item is that you're trying to feature. So, so I want to show you something that I just picked up. I'm pretty excited. I'm working on a paper making display and I got this for $12 on eBay. Watch this. It shows how the linen would be mashed and macerated to make it into pulp. <laughs> right? So I was very fortunate and happened to find a $12 eBay item. That's fantastic. Um, and we'll go into the display that I'm currently working on building for whenever the world opens back up. Um, but uh, you can't always find those so easy. So ask, maybe people have them. Maybe people have seen them. Maybe somebody wants to build one, especially if they're like, oh man, that'd be so cool to put in, to put in an exhibit or a display or a demonstration. I want to do that. So don't be afraid to ask around or say, hey, has anybody ever seen a reproduction of a, um, oh, what are those things called? The looms, the long looms that are often used for Viking tablet weaving where you tie it to one end and then you weave from the other end. I forget what it's called. I don't want to carry around a four foot one. I want like a two foot one. Can anybody make me one or does anybody have one on hand? So, and then again, remember, especially if you have limited space, it's good to have miniatures. You guys can all be jealous. A band loom. Thank you, Audette. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, suggestions? Or if you have a display that you have used or made before or you're trying to make or you want to make, if anybody wants suggestions or ideas, go ahead and put it in the chat. And at this point, you are free to unmute yourselves and speak if you'd like. Um, one of the best things I think I first picked up were several gigantic tablecloths, just yeah. single color, solid, large enough to fit basically the biggest table I could ever end up on, but you can always fold them down if you have a smaller table. So that way you've got them, I've got them in two or three different colors. That way I've got a couple different options depending on what I'm putting on top of them. I can make sure I get contrast instead of having everything sort of blur into the same color. Yeah, great suggestion, thank you. And kind of along those same themes, um, I do food and I find interesting looking napkins to help frame different parts of the display. Um, and then I have one that's just colorful that I usually put the things I want the most attention paid to. <laughs> yep, makes sense. Tagging on, tagging on to that, um, I will frequently use the box or bin that I brought the stuff in as part of my display to give myself the height. Yep. And sometimes you can put the tablecloth over it if you want to hide it, or you can put it right out if you like the look that it has. I know as a merchant, I will use boxes and bins that I store my wares in. And you're laughing, you do the same. <laughs> That's where I got the idea. <laughs> yep. Okay, any other? So, yes. I'm from Meridies, and this is just a caution that I'd kind of like to throw out there. The, I call it the science fair triptych, where it's a, a vertical piece of background with generally pictures and text uh, taped on or, or displayed. They're getting a little out of hand. They seem to be getting bigger. And we had a, um, right, just before we all got shot down in February, we had an event where, because there were so many of them, 
they all kind of faded into each other. It was, it was kind of um, discouraging, I think, for some people who had spent a lot of time on building those. So the things you showed where height was added with natural things like the, the loom or the, um, the mannequins, I think those are, if you can, more of the way to go. Yeah, I agree. And also the triptych itself, while useful, and I will use it for different things, is not as visually dynamic as different heights of different things, right? It's still this big monolith in the middle of your table. So depending on how you do it, you can either make effective use of it, or like you said, it could kind of just like, uh, it's a sea of, of, you know, structures that all jut up from their table. So. One of the things that is not done, but I'm working on as an idea is there are actually some images because I do prayer beads of pattern osters where they have like a bar with pattern osters hanging off of it. So what I'm working towards is actually basically getting my display to kind of look like that period image of what does that pattern oster table look like where they're working. That's awesome. Then if there is nothing else, we're going to go ahead and call it here. <clears throat> um, uh, let me get a link to the article that I talked about at the beginning. Uh, Lissa says, I did a display for archery gloves and a quiver. To give things life, I supplemented with a kid's bow and a standing hand statue. My arrows held the linen quiver in shape. I had a pro, pro type of a glove set with one right side out and the other inside out. Accidentally, <laughs> you didn't accidentally do nothing, honey. I accidentally won ANS champ because it was themed. <laughs> I'm sure you won because you were also extremely talented and skilled, but yes. That's a great story. All right, if you will all hold on for one moment, I will put in links really quickly to relevant things mentioned here. And then Lynn, if you wanna read anything that pops up in the meantime, while I'm grabbing these links. So this is the article that has the seven approaches to exhibit design. Prototype, seriously, they only had one other entrant and I was filling space. Then I, then I got more, but I couldn't back out. Audette, love the information. Gives me a lot more to think about for future displays. Thank you. And thank you for being one of the inspirational pieces of, or one of the inspirational displays. I loved it. So glad I popped by. Thank you. Thank you to uh, Savas. Uh, okay. Uh, Boom, Boominus says, sorry, I missed most of it. That's okay. Will you upload the recording somewhere for us to revisit? Yes. Um, I will be uploading it to my YouTube, which I will also link here. And no, Lynn, I did not mean to send the link to you privately. So let me repost it. So that's the link to the article. Thank you. That's what happens when everybody starts sending me messages. I think I'm responding to everybody. So that's the link to the article at the beginning of the class. This is a link to my YouTube channel. It's probably going to be a few weeks before this is up. I'm way backlogged on my videos. This is the link to the Amazon shop if you want to use it as a Pinterest. Again, fair disclosure, I do make, I think I've made like $33 total over several years. I don't make fat loot from it. It basically gets reinvested into my displays and dis <laughs> demonstrations. But if you buy anything off of that list, I do make money. So I want to disclose that. Um, Amazon.com. All right. Alex says, thank you. This was fantastic. Very informative for a service junkie who's gotten into period art during this whole shutdown time. Well, good. I'm Sorry that there's the shutdown, but I'm glad that you have been inspired into something new and I'm looking forward to seeing what you do. So I think I've put up the links to everything. There's one other link you posted earlier. What was that, Lynn? I don't remember. Um, I think that was just the link to your Amazon. Got it, page. okay. So the article, my YouTube channel, and the Amazon page, and then this will go up probably in the next few weeks. Antonio. Completely random question, but when it comes to competition displays, have you ever seen a situation where a particular art or science will be easier or more difficult to mount an effective display for? Yeah, all the time. 
For example, in a mixed discipline event, would it be easier to score higher with something like coin minting rather than brewing if one has equitable skill in both? Not because of your display, I don't think. I mean, let me, let me back up and say this. The better you can present your case to a judge, the higher your score is going to be. So if you have a more effective display, which includes your documentation, then yes, you'll probably score higher. But if you have a better display than somebody else, but can still answer all those questions to your judges, and this is very dependent on the kingdom that you're in, I can really only speak from my personal experience as the judges coordinator in the mid realm. If you can still answer all those questions and show the end product and show the thing, your display probably isn't gonna have much more. They may say, hey, next time you display this, I think it'd be really beneficial if people could see this process or this method or this step in things. But I don't think that your display too often is going to have a substantial impact on your score. Anybody want to disagree with me? I'm okay if you do, if you think I'm wrong. Okay, we got four minutes left. Go ahead. Um, yeah, no, I'm not disagreeing, but um, actually at South Oak and ANS this year, one of the things I did when uh, baking jumbles, I had done the recipe a few different times and I kept my failures and included that with the display so I could show the judges, here's what was wrong, here's why I did to change it, and here was like the learning process so they actually got to see the the failure. Here's the the good one. I also have ones with like modern rose water and period made like rose well, homemade rose water and just different ones so they could see different things, taste different things. That's brilliant actually. I'm glad that you gave that suggestion and that and shared that idea of my failures or my alternate experimentations. While I wouldn't call your failures necessarily the ugly or the deconstructed, that's kind of what we're talking about in terms of everything you present does not have to be the beautiful, perfect end product that you had intended or hoped for. It can also be that. It may not be that at all. I have some things sometime soon that I'm gonna be showing you all that I completely failed on. <laughs> there is no successful products, but I'm gonna show you anyways. So um, yeah, that's, that's a great point. And thank you for sharing that. And I, I loved seeing that when I saw it at the South Oak and a uh, John Dye says, thank you very much. was very informative. Thank you, John Dye, for joining us from Lockock. That was kind of exciting. Uh, it was, was, was my pleasure. And as I said, very informative. Got a lot out of it. Wasn't quite what I was looking for, but it was good. Oh, okay. What were you looking for? <laughs> um, I was more on the demonstration side of things. A um, couple of little pointers that we've picked up over here. We've used um, A1 banners using sort of period photos. So pictures, scripts, and that detailing the common information that the questions were asked. Okay. So I'm not, you're not having to repeat it there. And if nobody's actually stand there available, people don't walk away with not knowing what we are. Yeah. So. The thing to, to, that I think is important about, I guess, the difference between displays and demonstrations is be prepared to repeat the same thing over and over and over for the duration of whatever that event is or that commitment is and be prepared for lots of weird questions, some of which you won't be able to answer. And yep. that's, I, don't know, I don't know what that answer is, but you should join our group or come to one of our activities and we'll see if we can't find that, so. Pretty much, or ask them to put their um, details down and you'll get back to them. Right, right. It's always fun. Anyway, I have to actually go back to work, so thank you all very much. Thank you, <laughs> bye. All right, with that, I will put my name up here in the group. I am Aveline DeSharesbrook on Facebook. If you want to connect with me, by all means, send me a friend request and we can stay connected that way. I would love to see your displays. If you guys have changed or tweaked something or if you think there's something that I need to include the next time I teach this class, please send me more. I would love it. I don't have enough beautiful, wonderful examples. Not that I don't have great ones. I just can't get enough of seeing great displays. They excite me. I love seeing them. So please stay in touch. I appreciate you all coming out this evening. Lynn, thank you again, yet again, for hosting another one of my classes. You've got to be sick of me by now. She teach, I teach only on Tuesday nights, and she's the Tuesday night host, so she always has to speak. <laughs> but thank you very much, and also thank you for letting me see your display. 
Um, other than that, we're going to go ahead and sign off. Thank you all. Bye.